Um, it is so good to be with you all here today. I'm absolutely delighted to see so many people showing an interest in plant-based nutrition. And um, I've been asked to come here today to talk to you all about diabetes. Um, and I wonder if you know that you can actually eat as much as you want whilst also preventing, slowing down, or even reversing, curing your diabetes. And this can apply to anyone on their diabetes journey at any stage. And you can do this with a whole food plant-based lifestyle approach. Um, and so the next question to ask is, well, why is this so important? Because diabetes is a huge problem and it's growing. Almost 3.7 million people in the UK right now have a diabetes diagnosis. And there are an extra 12.3 million people at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. That doesn't even include the 1 million people estimated to be walking around with diabetes and they have absolutely no idea. The unfortunate thing is that if you have diabetes, you have an 80% chance of dying prematurely of either a heart attack or a stroke. And the slide there on the right shows you a representation of peripheral neuropathy. This is one of the many awful effects of diabetes. You have nerve damage from the high blood sugars, which can lead to numbness and accidental injury, or it can lead to severe intractable nerve pain, which as doctors we know is almost impossible to treat effectively. And you can also have impaired vision, blindness, um, you can have tummy upsets, kidney disease, impotence, uh, and even you, know, you could go so far as to have to have an amputation. These effects are real and severe, and they're growing. What do we do about it? How do we tackle this right now? Well, as doctors, I think around a third of you here are doctors and about two-thirds public, so I'm going to aim to keep this as simple as possible in the hopes that you can all understand it and use it for your patients as well. Doctors, how do we deal with it? We give medication. We give people tablets and needles in the hope that we can somehow slow this down. But of course, these, side, these medications have side effects. Sometimes they have dangerous side effects. And we know that it's not really a cure. It's simply a bandage that we use to try to halt the progression rather than healing it from the inside out. And what about people who have diabetes? What do they do? Well, they might try something to change their diet. They might try to maybe calorie restrict because they have heard that if they lose weight, they can improve their diabetes. Well, of course, this is true. But often, I mean, how many times have you all heard people say, oh, I, I went on a diet, I lost loads of weight, and then I kind of gained it all again, and then a little bit more. People find it really hard to stick to that. They're either hungry or they're miserable, and they kind of give it up. They might try a fad diet, perhaps a ketosis diet, or maybe even a high-fat, low-carb diet. And they can get some immediate results from that. But then there's also a risk to their quality of life long term and indeed their lifespan. But what if there was another way? What if, as doctors in this room, you could tell your type 1 diabetics that they have the power to have a normal lifespan? That they could potentially reduce their insulin needs by up to two thirds? What if you could tell your type 2 diabetics, if they're on insulin, that they could potentially come off it completely? That they could potentially halve their tablet needs within just one or two weeks of a change in diet? And that if they stuck to it for around six months or more, then typically they could come off all their medications. This is absolutely incredible stuff. Oh, hang on. There we go. So, today what I'm going to talk to you all about is firstly the causes of diabetes. Secondly, I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the dietary pitfalls in detail. And then lastly, I'm going to talk to you all about how a whole food plant-based lifestyle approach can be used to really treat and cure diabetes. 
But first of all, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about myself. I'm a GP partner. I've been a GP now for a long time, doctor for 14 years, and I've had some incredible results for my patients with a whole food plant-based diet approach. Really things that you perhaps couldn't imagine. I've been so impressed by it. But it wasn't always this way for me. And you may have had a little glimpse from my previous slide that um, I was initially quite resistant to a whole food plant-based diet approach. So that, that's me there um, on the left. I was technically obese at that time and I knew that I wanted to do something about it. I hadn't done any research, but I decided I would carb restrict. I would calorie count. I would exercise vigorously one to two hours every single day in the hopes of getting healthy. And I did. I lost weight. I went from a size 18 down to a size 8. And I was pleased with my results. But I still had a high cholesterol level. It runs in my family. Sudden death of my father whilst driving. Sudden death of my grandfather whilst playing tennis. I had a high cholesterol, and I hadn't managed to solve that problem. So, a few years later, jumpy slides. A few years later, I decided to do some proper research, and what I found was absolutely mind blowing. I started to follow the work of uh, clinicians like Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Colwell Esselstyn. Dr. Garth Davis, Dr. Michael Greger, and of course there are many, many more. And I realized that there are in fact mountains of evidence-based research to show that a whole food plant-based diet approach was fantastic to cure and to manage chronic diseases. There's epidemiological research, there's cellular biology, there's even randomized controlled trials. I was really impressed by all this, so I decided to give it a go myself. And within just four weeks, of adopting a whole food plant-based diet, I was able to bring my cholesterol levels down from dangerous levels to healthy levels, and I was able to actually run the London Marathon alongside my husband as well. So let's go back to diabetes. As I said before, we we're going to talk about the causes to start with. Okay, so with type 1 diabetes, we have genetic causes and we have autoimmune causes. With type 2 diabetes, we have genetic causes, and we also have lifestyle causes. Now, what do I mean by lifestyle causes? Well, there are quite a few. Um, being overweight is an independent risk factor for developing diabetes, and being obese, of course. Things like um, stress and depression, things like shift pattern working, um, things like um, a sedentary lifestyle, lack of exercise, erratic eating patterns, eating into the night. These are all things that can actually contribute to your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. But as this is a nutrition conference, I'm really going to stick to the diet causes for the rest of this talk. So type 1. Type 1 diabetes usually happens earlier on in life, and there are susceptibility genes, but 90% of the people who develop type 1 diabetes, uh, sorry, 90% of the people with susceptibility genes for type 1 diabetes don't actually develop type 1 diabetes. There's only around 10% of people with the susceptibility genes that develop it. So there is some sort of environmental trigger that leads you to the autoimmune <coughs> reaction that causes you to kill off your own pancreatic beta cells, the ones that make insulin. So we don't always know what that trigger is. It could be a viral exposure. It could be a bacterial exposure. Um, it could be something else, some sort of environmental toxin. But what many of you may not realize is that drinking cow's milk has now been proven in several studies to be linked to the development of type 1 diabetes. Now, bovine serum albumin and beta casein proteins, these are, these are cow milk proteins, they have a very similar structure to the beta cells of your pancreas. 
So it would make sense that if you were going to develop an immune reaction to these foreign proteins, that you would potentially also develop an immune reaction against your own cells that look very similar. But what about the causes of type 2? Now, we've talked about um, being overweight, but what about the dietary causes? Now, people often say, they almost always say, oh, it's the sugar, it's the carbs. That's what they say. And unfortunately, they'd actually be wrong about that. High blood sugars are the outcome. They are not the cause. The cause of insulin resistance, which is the main um, driver of type 2 diabetes, is in fact dietary trans fats, saturated fats, harmful vegetable oils, hydrolyzed oils, things like margarines, but of course, we're also talking about um, the animal fats here. So we've got the meat and the eggs and the milk and the cheese. These all contribute to the cellular changes that cause insulin resistance. So you can think about these kinds of foods, these kinds of fats as being like the bomb. And then when you add in processed sugar on top of these foods, you get the explosion. Let me explain <laughs> how it all works. So you need glucose from your food. It goes into the bloodstream. And of course, it needs to get inside the cell to provide the cell with energy. Glucose is your brain's preferred energy source, as well as the muscles and the other cells of your body. Glucose needs an invitation to get inside the cell. What happens is the insulin in your body binds to the glucose or it binds to the cell membrane of the cell via an insulin receptor. And once it's bound to the cell membrane, the glucose is allowed into the cell. So it's a bit like a lock and a key. Now, what happens here with insulin resistance is when you eat junk foods like donuts and pastries, and if you eat animal foods like meat, fish, milk, cheese, and eggs, what you're doing is you're distorting and you're stiffening these insulin receptors so that, unfortunately, no matter what the insulin is trying to do, the glucose simply stays in the bloodstream. The pancreas picks up on this and it tries to help out by pushing out more insulin, more and more and more insulin. But of course, the problem is, if your lock is already jammed, it doesn't matter how many new keys you're making, you're not going to be able to open the lock. This is insulin resistance. The mechanisms by which dietary animal fats cause insulin resistance are now well known. Scientists can actually track fatty acids from the bloodstream and they can monitor insulin resistance going up. They can remove fatty acids from the bloodstream and they can watch insulin resistance falling. And in fact, there was a study that looked at the calf muscles of healthy omnivores versus vegans. And in fact, what they were able to show was that the calf muscles of the vegans had far less fat trapped inside the muscle. And um, what you can see is that the, you can directly track the fat going from the bloodstream into the muscles and causing this insulin resistance process, this intramyocellular fat. This is the primary driver that causes insulin resistance and then type 2 diabetes. But there are other mechanisms as well. So what happens when you eat these kinds of foods is that they also directly damage the mitochondria of the cell. Now, mitochondria are like the powerhouse of the cell. And of course, when you're damaging them, the cell has far less energy. And of course, then that also increases the demand for insulin. And another mechanism is if you look at the pancreatic cells themselves. These kinds of fats from animal products and from junk food fats actually directly kill your pancreatic beta cells. So this graph shows you oleate and palmitate. These are two kinds of dietary fats. The longer that your pancreatic beta cells are exposed to these um, palmitate fats, the ones that are contained in junk food fats and in animal fats, the more likely they are to die. But you can see that oleate exposure does not have any effect at all on the pancreatic cells. 
Oleate is a fat that you would find in nuts and seeds, avocados, olives, foods like that. So this is a really important thing for you all to understand. There are several mechanisms that will cause insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. You've got fat cells spilling uh, uh, fat back into the bloodstream. You've got the clogging of the insulin receptors. You've got inhibition of insulin function itself. You've got inhibited energy release from the mitochondria of the cell. And of course, all these processes lead to more insulin and more glucose in the bloodstream. So now that we know the causes, surely we can just rely on medications to kind of help us out here. And this is what doctors are all about. We're all about the medications usually, aren't we? So surely we can just fix it with the medications. Well, no, no, we can't. Unfortunately, even if you have fantastic blood sugar control as a type 2 diabetic, you will still increase your risk of heart disease and end organ damage. Some of you are likely to be familiar with the ACCORD study. The ACCORD study was hoping to show that the better control you had of your blood sugars, the less likely you were to have side effects or complications from your diabetes and the healthier you would be. How wrong they were. They actually had to stop the study 18 months early because the people in the intervention arm of the study had an increased mortality rate. So in other words, the more times they had visits from the doctor, the more medications they were given, the more likely they were, in effect, to die. Now, I think this is probably likely to be due to the fact that they had more insulin which, which we know to be independently associated with an increased risk of mortality, but also um, they had a combination of other tablets which were really pushing their pancreas into overdrive. Um, so when we give tablets in the UK, the sulfonylureas are one of the most commonly prescribed tablets for diabetes. Glyclozide is the one that most people prescribe. And there are several studies to show that there are, in fact, adverse effects from prescribing glyclozide particularly. Um, it pushes the pancreas to make more insulin. And the study on the left showed that there was actually an increased risk of cancer when you take glyclozide, uh, specifically of the breast, prostate, and colon. The UK PDS was also able to show us that if you have a combination of metformin with glyclozide, about half of the people who were on both needed another medication within three years to actually try to control their diabetes over and above the expected decline that you would um, predict. So here then we get to the discussion of insulin itself. Now we all need insulin. We make insulin. Type 1 diabetics can't make insulin and so of course they have to inject it. But the aims with type 1 diabetes are to really bring down your insulin requirements. This is the key to living a normal lifespan as a type 1 diabetic. When you have type 2 diabetes and you got to the stage where you need to have injected insulin, you know that you're not going down a path to recovery, unfortunately. Because insulin is independently associated with atherosclerotic plaques on our blood vessels. It makes us more hungry, which then obviously increases our appetite and causes us to gain weight. Um, it can increase cancer risk. It propels us into making more IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, which also increases our risk of cancer, independently of the diabetes. So medications are simply not the answer. This is why I believe that food has to be the number one thing that all doctors talk to their patients about when they have a diabetes diagnosis. Which brings me neatly on to the next stage of this talk, which is the kinds of foods and fad diets that can potentially harm you when you have a diabetes diagnosis. So the high-fat, low-carb approach is really popular, and you do get some immediate benefits from this. You can lose weight, and you can bring down your blood sugars, and um, you can... In two-thirds of cases, you can also reduce your cholesterol as you are losing weight. However, there was a study in the British Journal of Nutrition back in 2012 which showed that when you're on a high-fat, low-carb diet, it stiffens your peripheral arteries. 
It reduces the ability of your small vessels in your body to swell and to constrict, to react to stimuli, which also then increases your risk of high blood pressure, heart disease, and stroke. The only study to directly compare a healthy, high-fat, low-carb diet with a healthy, high-carbohydrate diet showed that when you're on a high-fat, low-carb diet, you have far less blood supplied to your coronary arteries. These are the arteries that crown your heart. They're the arteries that allow oxygen to put to your heart to allow it to beat. So you can see that these mechanisms will lead you to health problems further down the line. And we know from <laughs> earlier on in my talk that there are mechanisms with this way of eating that could also increase your insulin resistance and your risk of diabetes. The ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet uh, makes you have 30 <laughs> grams of carbohydrates or less, which is less than 10% of your caloric needs each day. Now, what's great about the ketogenic diet is that it limits your processed foods. You're not allowed to have junk foods on this diet. It limits your refined sugars um, and your refined flour. But it also limits your brown rice, your beans, your lentils, your chickpeas, your starchy vegetables, your fruits, maybe a few berries. But it limits a lot of what we would all consider to be healthy food choices. <coughs> Why is it so tempting? Why is it so popular? Well, people get quick results. They dramatically lose weight initially. They get a flat line blood glucose. And so that encourages them that they're on the right track. But unfortunately, this is not a good long-term solution. The ketogenic diet works by essentially mimicking starvation. As I said before, the brain loves glucose, but we need to survive in times of scarcity. So it's really clever. What the body does is it allows you to use fat metabolism. The, the, the uh, liver makes ketones, um, which allows the brain then energy through ketones rather than through, through glucose. I think this is why we're one of the most adaptable species on the planet, but we are not designed to live in semi-starvation states or mimicking starvation states for long periods of time. It reduces our lifespan. Now, this next slide is very busy. I apologize for that. I don't know if you're going to even be able to read all of the complications on this slide. But the short-term complications of ketosis would include things like um, bad breath and constipation, a bit of brain fog, maybe some rashes. Um, flu-like symptoms maybe, but then once you've got used to the ketosis diet, then you're setting yourself up for a lot of other chronic long-term health conditions. The most serious of which, of course, at the bottom is death. Now, I don't want to be too overdramatic about this, but there are five clinical studies which show death directly correlating with the ketogenic diet. So you really have to think twice before you consider this as a long-term plan. Um, so... Okay, yeah. So, so how, can we, how can we reduce our blood sugars and increase our insulin sensitivity and increase our lifespan? Well, I think you've all kind of got the answer from earlier on in the talk. We know that this can be achieved. All these three things can be achieved using a whole food, plant-based diet approach. We know from earlier in the talk that it increases your insulin sensitivity. We know that it improves the responsiveness of your peripheral blood vessels. And we therefore also know that it reduces your long-term chronic disease risk for many other diseases. This is what the whole food plant-based food pyramid looks like. To me, this looks like a lot more of a healthy way of going about um, improving your chronic disease risk. And so what are the other reasons why this diet approach will work for you? Well, many of you may have already tried it, so you may know some of these answers. But first of all, it is actually filling. This, this slide just gives you an idea of how many phytonutrients, how many different sources of fiber you could fit into your stomach on the same amount of calories um, as you would with some refined oils and animal products. You can see that you've got a lot more food choice with, with the nutrients as well packed in. Why else is this a good idea? 
it's actually sustainable. Now, there are many studies to show that people can sustain this long term once they've got their heads around the idea of what they might eat over the first few weeks. This is a really good study which I wanted to draw your attention to. The reason I like this study is because it's a randomized controlled trial and it's done by GPs. Um, it was done in New Zealand and what they were able to do was to give a whole food plant-based diet approach idea to these patients. They were obese and they had diabetes or they had high cholesterol. And these patients were not um, told to calorie restrict in any way whatsoever. They said you can eat as much as you like and there was no compulsion to exercise. They, they, they didn't even tell them, okay, just you know, try and do a little bit more, keep active, nothing like that. And what they found was that these people were not only able to lose weight, several kilograms, but they were able to sustain that weight loss for many, many, many months after the intervention, even up into years after the intervention. And why else is a whole food plant-based diet approach useful? This slide shows us a little bit about the Adventist Health Study too. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists are a really useful group of, uh, of people to look at and study because they have a lot of things in common. They come from a very religious background. They're all uh, advised to look after their bodies. They've got good community links with each other. They don't drink. They don't smoke. They don't take drugs. But they all differ a little bit in what they decide to eat. So on the left, you can see that they studied an awful lot of these people, well over 60,000 people involved in this study. And you can see that on average, the people who were omnivorous had the highest BMI. They were the heaviest. Um, the people who had a flexitarian diet, so they maybe had meat perhaps once a week, they were lighter again on average. The people who were pesco-vegetarian were lighter again. The vegetarians lighter again. In fact, it was only the vegans in the Adventist group that had actually managed to maintain on average a normal BMI in the US group that they looked at. And you can see from the slide on the right, there's a very similar pattern, of course, to the rates of type 2 prevalence in this population. Now, if you're flexitarian and you're having meat once a, once a week or so, the good news is, according to this study, you'll be reducing your risk of developing type 2 diabetes by around 28%, which is fantastic. If you decide to go vegetarian, according to this study, you'll be reducing your risk by around 61%. If you go whole food plant-based, you'd be reducing your risk of type 2 diabetes by a whopping 78%. These figures are absolutely amazing. Another mechanism that you can have a healthy whole food plant-based diet approach to treating diabetes is through our increased knowledge of the microbiome. It was touched upon earlier in this, um, in this uh, presentation with, by Dr. Alan Desmond. But this is really the key to future research on nutrition. And I'm hoping that it can actually draw us away from polarizing discussions of all fats are bad and all carbs are bad. Because what we can begin to understand is that having a fully functional and healthy microbiome is in fact one of the keys to a healthy life and reducing your risk of chronic diseases. You can make vitamins in your gut. You can absorb them from your gut. You can produce feel-good hormones from your gut. And of course, what optimizes your gut ecology? A whole food plant-based diet. What happens when you eat a lot of dietary fiber is that the beneficial gut bugs start to ferment it, start to digest it. They produce butyrate, which is a short-chain fatty acid. Fantastic stuff, butyrate. What does it do? Well, it draws cholesterol out from your bloodstream and um, it also um, imp improves your um, insulin sensitivity. So again, it brings it back to reducing your diabetes risk. So what are we going to do next? Well, for the doctors in this room, I just really want to advise you to be an inspiration for your patients. Please give them the gift. Give them the gift of accountability and enthusiasm. Help them to find ways that they could potentially make this diet change work for them. Remind them that if they're type 1 diabetic, they can have a normal life expectancy. They can reduce their insulin needs by up to two thirds. These are all possible things that they can achieve. If they're type 2, they can come off insulin if they're bad enough to be on it. They can reduce their medication requirements by up to 50% even in the first fortnight on average. And within six months, even the most severe cases of type 2 diabetes, they could potentially come off their medications. This is how effective it is. 
And what about the rest of us in this room? Well, my advice would be to really try to share this with your friends and family if you feel able to, because this information needs to go far and wide. And of course, people are going to have questions. They're bound to have questions about it. And that's a good thing, because questions show you that they're interested and that they're trying to understand how this could fit into their lives. And of course, the top question that people have, where am I going to get my protein from? I need protein. Okay. Well, the good news is you really can advise them, please do not worry about your protein requirements. Perhaps if they're over the age of 65 or if they're an athlete, or you, know, you might want to show them something like this infographic to say, look, there are plenty of dietary sources of protein on a whole food plant-based diet. Please don't worry about it. As long as you're eating these healthy food types, you're going to have plenty, plenty of protein. Then they'll say, what about calcium? I need calcium. And you can again reassure them. You can say, well, when you're on a whole food plant-based diet, these are the kinds of foods that you can get calcium from. And you actually need slightly less calcium on a whole food plant-based diet. And the good news is that on a whole food plant-based diet, um, you're actually going to um, have more bioavailability of that calcium compared to if you're having it from cow's milk. A lovely nutritarian checklist that I really want to draw your attention to is the G-bombs. The G-bombs by Dr. Joel Thurman, I have to um, credit him for that. It's just a really great way to tell people, okay, just remember these kinds of foods every day. Greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. If you could just at least keep it as simple as that, people can remember. The next question people will ask you is, well, what kind of foods can I eat? What kind of foods? Well, the answer, of course, is every kind of food. And you can give them plenty of inspiration. It's a little bit light in here, so you may not be able to see this, but you've got breakfast pancakes, you've got porridge, you've got chocolate smoothies. For lunch, you know, there's plenty of lunch ideas here. When you're out and about or at home, I'd recommend having some sort of salad every single day. Dinner ideas. What's useful is if you can help people understand some simple swaps because they're going to find it a struggle to understand at first. So you can say, okay, well, if you like a chicken curry, why don't you try a chickpea curry? If you like a spaghetti bolognese, try this lentil bolognese recipe. It's really good. What about your Sunday roast? Well, try that kind of Sunday roast and see how it tastes for you. See how good you feel. Until pretty soon, they'll be able to understand that it's very possible and achievable. Now, if you've been inspired by any of the things that I've said to you today... I would really encourage you to look into buying these books for the people who have diabetes or for the people who are interested in helping others with diabetes. I get no royalties, by the way, from, from these books. Um, the first is by Dr. Neil Barnard and the second is by Dr. Joel Furman. It's just a really nice way for you to understand more fully how a plant-based approach can work, what to do, what to cook and why. If you're one of these people that prefers an online resource, I'd highly recommend the Mastering Diabetes course. It's run by two type 1 diabetics. And again, you've got a bit more one-to-one -one support. You sign up. You've got recipe ideas. It's a really good resource for people. Now, what I'd love for you to do now is um, to get your phones out. And I want you now to get ready to send me an email. So this is your chance to get your phones out and get ready to send me an email. The reason is I'd love to be able to share more resources with you. And for the doctors in the room or for anyone else who is interested in the science, I'd love to be able to send you some of the references I've used for today's talk so that you can read the evidence for yourself. <coughs> you can decide for yourself if this is a diet choice that makes sense. Now, many of you um, will be familiar with it. Um, but if you're on Instagram, you can follow me on Plant Power Doctor. And what now? Well, hopefully you've all got your phones nearby because now is your chance to email me. You can email me on Gemma Newman at doctors.org.uk. I'm going to give you the chance to do that right now, I'll give you a moment to email me. And once you've emailed me, and not only can I send you the references for the talk, but if you're interested, I can sign you up for a Facebook group called Plant Power 
um, nutrition forum, PBN forum. And it's an opportunity for you guys to ask questions or to post interesting stories or articles um, and really to learn more about how a whole food plant-based journey can improve lifestyles. And uh, what else do I suggest that you do? Well, many of you may have already tried something like this, but if you haven't, I'd really encourage you to have a 21-day challenge to try it out for yourself to see how you feel because then you'll be much more familiar with the kinds of things that you can advise your patients or advise your friends and family. Lastly, I think it's going to be really good for you guys to recommend this to a friend or a family member because everyone in this room knows someone who could benefit from this advice because we've all lost loved ones, often before their time. These stories of heartbreak and tragedy are common to us all. And this is your opportunity to change these stories, to be the change that you'd like to see in the people that you love around you. This is your chance to, in fact, be the hero of your own story. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Gemma. And we'll ask um, Luke to come and share his journey of a whole food plant-based um, transition. Sorry about that. There you go. Thank you. 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 Thank you.